Hi, welcome to God Day. Um, my name is Sylvia. Have you ever reflected on your life and said to yourself, my life is a mistake. Maybe I didn't do the things I was supposed to do. Maybe that's why this, this is all happening to me. You might be thinking, I'm not satisfied with where I am now. Could it be a result of my actions and, and, and things that I've done wrong? Well, if you are thinking like that, you're not the only one. Because that's the same way Jacob felt. He lived his entire life thinking that it was a mistake. He believed that everything bad was happening to him because of his actions. But this was not so, and he was to find out later on in life. In Genesis 25, verses 22 to 23, I'll read what happened. His mother, Rebecca, was pregnant, and she was feeling uncomfortable with her pregnancy because she felt that there was a conflict within her. And so she went to God and God spoke to her in Genesis 25, 22 to 23. He said, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. And so the babies were jostling within her. And this is what God said to her. He had ordained this from the beginning. Jacob would be over, he would rule over his brother Esau even before he was born. And so Jacob did not have any say in the matter because God had already decided that this was supposed to be so. And so on the day of his birth, Jacob came out holding on to Esau's heel. Jacob also means he clutches the heel. The popular phrase, pulling my leg comes from it and it means joking with me or lying to me, you must be pulling my leg. But it also means other things. It means usurper. So Jacob's future will be heavily influenced by acts of deception. Now in Genesis 25, 29 to 34, and I will read that Genesis 25, 29 to 34, it says, um, Jacob did something that was um, very interesting. And it, was, it had to do with the birthright. And it says here, Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and Esau was very tired and Esau said to J Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. And then Jacob was very, very cunning. Jacob said, sell me your birthright of, as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus Esau, Esau despised his birthright. So Jacob was very cunning. And I'm sure, you know, Jacob was a mother's boy. And it, the, the Bible says that Esau was one who went out and he was a hunter. But Jacob was somebody who stayed at home with his mom most of the time. And so um, he learned to cook and he, he must have been chatting with his mom. And his mom probably would have told him of the way he was born and all the things that God said concerning him. And so Jacob has had it at the back of his mind that he was supposed to have his brother's birthright. And so the opportune time came. He was making lentil soup 
And I make lentil soup sometimes, and the aroma is really, truly tempting, but not enough to trade something as precious as a birthright. Jacob cooked the stew, and the opportune time came. Esau was asked for some, and he cunningly deceived him and took his birthright. Now, he didn't take it for, from him physically, but spiritually, Esau had already sold his birthright just by pronouncing these words to Jacob. And so sometimes it's also very, um, we should also be careful of our words and we shouldn't be too hasty to speak. Um, the Bible advises us to be slow to, to speak. We shouldn't be quick to speak. We should, we should think about what we say before we utter words. But Esau didn't do that. He was very hungry and he was ready to do whatever um, was necessary for him to get something to eat. God was not pleased with Esau, but he already knew what would happen. And so the deception in Jacob's life continued. And um, in Genesis 27, we have another instance where Isaac requests his favorite dish. Isaac believes he is about to die any day and he asks for his favorite dish to be prepared. He speaks to, to Esau and he asks him to prepare something so that he can bring it and eat of this dish and then bless Esau. Uh, pronounce the, um, the firstborn's birthright upon Esau. And Rebecca, hear, Rebecca hears of this and proceeds to put a plan in action to give her favorite son his brother's inheritance. And so they cunningly deceive Isaac who pronounces a blessing on the firstborn, of the firstborn upon Jacob. And in Genesis 27 verse 29, let's I'll just read that, let's read that together. Genesis 27 verse 29, Isaac says to Jacob, let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who who bless you. And so Isaac pronounces these blessings upon his son Jacob without realizing it. And so Esau comes back from the field and he prepares the uh, meal uh, for his father. And then he goes to his father and he asks, he says to his father, he says, um, let's read, it says, in, it starts from verse 30, Genesis 27, it says, um, Jacob has scarcely gone out of the presence of Isaac, his father. Then Esau, his brother, came in from hunting, and he also made savory food, and he brought it to his father, and he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, who are you? And so he said, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. And Jacob trembles. Jacob is trembling and he says, Who? Where is the one who hunted the game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came and I have blessed him. And indeed, he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried exceedingly great and bitter cry. And he said, Bless me also, my father. But he said, Your brother came with the seed and has taken away your blessing. Esau is distraught. Esau is upset. He cries out in anguish. He cries out a bitter cry. But Esau, Isaac could not do anything about it. And it's just so interesting how words, just words that came out from, from Isaac's mouth could be repeated but they couldn't. Those words that came out of Isaac had so much power, they went out to accomplish exactly what he said would be done. How much more God and his word. 
but it's just an interesting lesson to learn. So obviously Esau is upset. Esau hates Jacob and he plots to kill him and Jacob has to run away. Now Isaac and, and Rebekah come together and they bless Jacob and they send him away. They send him to the house of Bethuel, his grandfather, and Laban, his uncle. Now, when we read Genesis um, 28, 12 to 15, we see that there's an encounter. And it says, uh, verse 12 to 15, and I shall read, um, it says, uh, Jacob went from Bathsheba and went towards Haran. And so he came to a certain place and he stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and he put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set upon the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there were angels of God descending and ascending, ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So Jacob experienced a promise from God himself. And so we just come to realize that with all that happened in the life of Jacob, God's hand was on it. Yes, everything that happened, God had already ordained it. And so Jacob hears from God and he proceeds to go to his uncle's house and to work for Laban, who is his uncle, who is interestingly enough, equally as deceitful. He deceives Jacob, who worked for seven years to pay for the bride price of his daughter, Rachel. And on the morning after the wedding, we all know the story, Leah is presented instead of Rachel. And then Jacob has to work another seven years for Rachel. Um, he had felt how it was to be deceived several times. Now, Jacob proceeded to prosper um, under the harsh hand of Laban, and then he decides to leave. And God is in his leaving as well, because in Genesis 31, 31, Jacob he, um, heard um, that Laban's sons were saying, jo Jacob has taken everything our father owned and he's gained all this wealth from what um, belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. And then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. And so Jacob flees from the untrustworthy Laban who um, pursues him. Now Laban catches up with Jacob and after a confrontation where Jacob recounts the harsh treatment at the hands of Laban, they finally part in peace. But this happened because an angel of the Lord had visited Laban in a dream the night before, and he had warned him to leave Jacob alone. So he departs, Laban blesses his family, his children, his grandchildren, and he goes back home and he leaves Jacob to proceed. Now, by now, Jacob is on his way back into his land and he gets, he sends a word ahead of him to his brother Esau because he's really worried about him because of what he did to him in the past, Jacob hasn't forgotten and he believes that Esau still hates him and is definitely out to get him. So he sends a word and he gets a word back that Esau is actually coming to meet him. Now he is so afraid. Jacob is so afraid and he's thinking of his life. He's thinking, what kind of life am I having at the moment? 
He's been running all his life in fear. Jacob must have felt in a turmoil. He had reached a place in his life where he needed a spiritual release or a breakthrough. Things just couldn't continue the same way. Has, has that ever happened to you where you've got to a point in your life and you're thinking, things can't just continue like this. I can't just go from day to day managing and struggling and, and, and going through this or that or whatever it is that is, either that is bothering you. It gets to a point where you just can't take it anymore and you think, I have to do something about this. I have to confront God, I have to speak to God, I have to get an answer from God because I just can't go on like this. And yes, he was blessed, he had prospered, he had his beloved wife, Rachel, he had um, a son by her and he, he, had, he, was, he was going to have another one by her as well. And he had so many children with Leah and their two servants, he had possessions, he had wealth, and yet he was fleeing once again. He was in fear of his future. He was about to meet his brother who hated him. And the Bible says in Genesis 32 verse seven, he said that Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he prayed for God's deliverance. And he reminded God of his promises uh, and that's in verse 40, uh, 24. So let's, let's just uh, read that because Jacob is at his wit's end. He comes to a point where he just can't go on anymore. And he wants to, he's praying. And he's asking God. And he's speaking to God. And it, the Bible says that he wrestles with God. So let's read this. It's uh, Genesis 32. And it's verse uh, 22. It says, and he arose that night and he took two of his wives and his two female servants and 11 sons and crossed over the fort of Jabbok. And he took them and set them over the brook and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man in capital, capital M, which means it's a special person, an angel of God or the Lord himself wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, this is Jacob, he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And so sometimes we have to wrestle with God. The kingdom of, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violence take it by force. Jacob emerged from his encounter with God, and he knew he was a new man. He was a new man because God changed his name. He changed his name from Surplanter to Israel. He changed his name. And Jacob was free at that point. And so Jacob went forward and they say, um, the Bible, according to the Bible, Jacob um, and Esau meet. And when they meet, they, you know, they fall upon each other. Esau obviously does not hate him like he thinks, like Jacob believes he does. And he falls upon him and they cry and they talk and they reminisce. And Esau invites Jacob back to where he lives. But um, Jacob um, asks um, permission for Esau to go ahead and that he will follow because he has a lot of um, people with him. And so they part in peace. So that's a good thing. Uh, but Jacob has to face another tragedy in the life of Rachel, the love of his life. Rachel dies when she is giving birth to their second son, Benjamin. And I can imagine Jacob must have been so devastated. He watched over his two sons, Jacob and Benjamin. And he, he, those are like 
though those are who he loved you know and he must have been pouring out his love on these two boys in the absence of his wife Rachel and he was causing his sons the sons of Leah and the sons of the two handmaids to be very jealous and angry and we know what happened we know the story of how Jace, uh, Joseph was sold into slavery and it says um, that Jacob was given the news um, that Jacob had been killed by a beast because obviously they lied and Jacob again was back in a place of sorrow in a place of devastation and the, de the, the Bible talks about the way he mourned and the fact that he mourned and could not be comforted and he mourned so much that even his sons who did this wicked thing against him and Joseph felt so terrible and they must have felt very very bad and repentant of what they had done and so Jacob's life seems to always take a downhill turn and he's thinking my life has been a mistake everything I've done in my life is a mistake all the sins I've committed and all the things I've done the deceit and stuff must is what is causing my life to be like this and Jacob this is how Jacob is living his life and we we, we hear we, we don't realize how Jacob is feeling about his life until it comes to a point where Jacob is brought into Egypt and he meets Pharaoh Joseph introduces him to Pharaoh and when we read Genesis 42 verse 38 it tells us what Jacob tells says to Pharaoh so in 42 verse 38 um, it says here um, I'm thinking okay uh, 4238 uh, it it tells us of what um, Jacob says to Pharaoh now Pharaoh is asking Jacob how he is and Jacob is saying to Pharaoh you know my life has been a life of um, of sorrow you know I've lived a long life but they have been full of full of sorrow and he's he's, he's telling Pharaoh that he's never been happy in his life and it's so e interesting because he doesn't realize at that point that God is with him God is the one that has instigated all this to happen and after this Jacob begins to experience the goodness of God and in his life he had he had his son back he had his son Joseph back Joseph who was second in command to the to Pharaoh he had his family with him they lived in plentiful they lacked nothing the Bible says that Joseph nourished his family he fed them with the best of the land in a time of famine and I think it was then that Jacob suddenly realized that his life was not a mistake and that if if Joseph had not been sold into slavery the whole tribe would have perished in famine Jacob realized that he was to be the leader of the tribe of Israel and not his older brother Esau God had been with him even before he was born and God had shown himself faithful in his life indeed God had never failed him if he had just trusted in him he would have lived a more joyful life and so at the end of his life he was in the position to bless the children his children and his grandchildren and he called each one of his children and he began to pronounce a blessing upon him and when he got to the turn of Joseph Joseph presented his two sons to Jacob the eldest was Manasseh, Manasseh and the youngest was Ephraim and Jacob was about to do something extraordinary he reached out his right hand and he put it on the hand of the youngest and he reached out his left hand and he put it on the hand head of his oldest uh, grandson so he placed Manasseh under Ephraim Joseph wasn't happy 
Joseph was displeased when it happened. Genesis 48, 17 talks about it. He says, um, when Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand on the hand of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's. And Joseph said to his father, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. He says, I know my son, I know. He shall become a people. He shall also be great, but truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall be a multitude of nations. Joseph was saying, not Joseph, um, Jacob was saying, Joseph, I didn't make a mistake. Joseph, I've only just realized that my life was not a mistake. My life was not a mistake. Everything I went through, everything I went through from my father's house to Laban's house, to my journey, to, to, to what happened to you and, and me being here in Egypt it was not a mistake. No, Joseph, Jacob is saying to Joseph, my life was not a mistake and I'm not making a mistake. Manasseh shall be under Ephraim. Ephraim shall be the firstborn and Manasseh shall be the second. And I have not made a mistake in doing this. And that is why I'm doing this because I'm no longer afraid to face the fact that I did not make a mistake in my life. Your life is not a mistake. Wherever you are today is not a mistake. Re just be patient, wait, and you will see the faithfulness of God because whatever has happened to you has happened because God has ordained it. He is the one that guides your footsteps. He is the one that orchestrates where you go and how you go. And so wait, just wait patiently and see the salvation of the Lord because he is faithful. He's a faithful God. He's faithful to you and he's faithful to me. God bless you and have a God day.